Check one, two, three, four. Check one, two, three, four. Check one, two, three, four. Check one, two, three. Can you hear me, Nicole? Check one, two, three, four. Check. Check one, two, three, four. 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 Nicole, are you talking about the Avion channels? Are you talking about the Avion channels? I can turn that monitor back on down there if that helps. I usually turn it off because it creates so much of a feedback loop, but I can try turning it back on if that helps. Really? Hang tight. Hold on a second. So I can carry that monitor down there on the floor. What about now? Can you hear it now? You should be hearing it out of that thing right there. You, you don't hear me? Okay. Yeah, try the Avion. You hear me? Uh, the vocals are going to be on, it's going to be Avion channel 12. Check one, two, three, four. Check one, two, three, four. So go and turn the, let, turn the channel up for the number 12 on there. There should be a volume level on a per channel basis. Mark, does she have all the other, um, can you mute all the other channels for her except the one for the vocals? I think if you go and, if you go, you can go and mute every channel except the vocals. Of course, she's probably going to want the rest of those too. Do you hear me in 12? Check one, two, check one, two, check one, two, check one, two, check one, two. Hang tight a second, Nicole. So bus seven's going to be. Let me know if this makes a difference. Um.
Does this make a difference? <laughs> I am in your head completely now. <laughs> hey, let me ask you guys something. Do you still hear me right now? Okay, good. So I can turn the house off and y'all can hear me. All right, great. All right, cool. Yeah, it was that it was the signal wasn't going the Avion's very strong, so Check one, two, three, four. Check one, two, three, four. Check one, two, three, four.
check one, two. Test one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Test. Check. Sound good? Okay. All right. Sounds good. Welcome to worship. These are the days of Elijah, declaring the word of the Lord. And these are the days of your servant. Righteousness being restored And those are the days of great trials Of famine and darkness and storm Till we are the voice in the desert Crying, preparing the way of the Lord Behold, He comes Riding on the clouds Shining like the sun Servant David rebuilding a temple of praise. And these are the days of great harvest. The fields are as wide in the world. And we are the laborers in your vineyard, declaring the word of the Lord. Behold. There's no God like Jehovah. 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 Take it off mute. I, I, I'll do what I can on my end. 
You're doing everything right on your end. Hey, what a good day it is to be in worship, especially indoors. <laughs> uh, we had a feeling this might be a good day to be inside, so uh, it is good, and it is good to be in worship, so welcome. We are so glad that all of you are here as we continue to prepare our hearts and minds for worship. Let me make sure you're up to date on a few other programs and announcements, things that are happening in our congregation. First of all, I want to be, make sure you're aware that on Monday nights at 7 o'clock here on campus, we're having a Bible study. Uh, it's called Oneness Embrace. It's a study led by Dr. Tony Evans, being facilitated by Scott and Margaret Mason. Uh, we'd love for you to be here. It's studying our unique creation as one human race. And, uh, you know, I'm just, when I think about this study and this topic and how timely it is, I'm reminded that when Jesus, on the last night of his life, gathered in the garden and, and prayed, John accounts of the things he prayed for, and at the top of that list, he prayed that his people would be unified as God and the Father and the Spirit are unified. And so unity among Christians, unity in creation is such a key uh, uh, attribute for, for Christ, and so uh, what a timely study as we look at one human race and study this, so that'll be tomorrow night at 7 o'clock here on campus. Additionally, on Wednesdays online, at 1 o'clock or 6.30 p.m., we're going to continue our series uh, that we're going through called The World Behind the Bible. A couple weeks ago, as I was thinking about you know, our Bible study programs, uh, I was thinking about this unique year that we're in, 2020, and all the curveballs that have been thrown our way in this time. And I would imagine that at some point in our future, when we're recounting this to uh, future generations, they say, well, what was 2020 like? I, I hope at some point we'll get to the, the place where we can kind of laugh about it and say, well, you know, we opened up all the doors, we worship inside, we wore masks, we spread out. I mean, I, hopefully at some point we'll get to the place where we just kind of laugh about all the things. We're, but this will always be a part of our story, this experience that we're going through. And so as we go through these unique times in history, it, it shapes who we are. It shapes our story. It even shapes our understanding of God. And so what we've been doing on Wednesdays is going through all those major historical events, those significant uh, game changers that have impacted God's people and their story and the things that are happening. And so we'd love for you to be here uh, tomorrow night at 7 for Oneness Embrace or join us online uh, on Wednesday for the World Behind the Bible or do both. Uh, we'd love for you to be a part of those programs. Thank you all for taking uh, the proper precautions and protocols, and thank you to everybody who responded to our survey that went out this week. It was very helpful as the elders and I met on Thursday night and just uh, went through a time of discernment and thought about next steps, and uh, so we'll continue to, to move forward, but we recognize that one of the uh, keys in that uh, response was proper precautions that made other people feel safe. Um, and so thank you for doing this. Um, I, I feel blessed that I have to preach and I can't wear a mask while I'm doing that because I really don't enjoy wearing a mask. But we recognize that this is something we can do to love our neighbors and these protocols are something we can do uh, to care for each other. And so thank you for, for doing that. I know it's a little extra, but thank you for the effort it took to, to come and be here and, and follow these protocols. I also want to thank an uh, incredible group of people. Uh, uh, Friday night, I sent out a text, I said, uh, to our, our men's group, to our young men's group, to our AV team, and I said, hey, can anybody help come in the morning? And I tell you what, we had, what, about 20, 25 people here yesterday, and in 30 minutes, they cleared out all the chairs, got everything set up. Uh, this AV team figured out how to reconfigure everything we're doing outside and do it inside and still do everything online. Oh, by the way, good morning and hello to our YouTube live crowd uh, while we're saying hello uh, will you join me in thanking our AV team and volunteers and praise team again for all their work. And also, we're going to hand the peace. So as we uh, welcome our online group, uh, I invite you to share the peace of Christ. The peace of Christ be with you all this morning as we are here for worship. And uh, wave to each other. It's good to see you. Good looking crowd this morning. And now, friends, let's come together in the spirit of worship using the words from Psalm 103 as our call to worship. Praise the Lord, O my soul. All my inmost being, praise his holy name. Praise the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all the Lord's blessings. The one who forgives our sins and the one who heals our diseases. 
the one who has redeemed our lives from the pit of sin and despair, and who has crowned us with love, grace, and compassion, the one who satisfies our desires with good things. Praise the Lord, O my soul, all my inmost being. Praise his holy name. Friends, will you join me in prayer? Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for the gift of this day and the gift of these people, these brothers and sisters in Christ gathered here in this room and gathered online and worshiping digitally. Lord, you have uh, made a way in this season for us to continue to be your people and your church. And so as we are gathered this morning, we once again pray for your guidance. Holy Spirit, thank you for uh, keeping it safe enough for us to travel this morning, and thank you for uh, stirring us this morning and, and putting that desire in us to gather as your people for worship. And so God, as we are here, we pray uh, for your continued faithfulness, but mainly for ours. We know that you are faithful. We pray that as we are gathered, you will give us the ability to put aside all the distractions, perhaps the agenda of our day or the expectations of our week, any stress or anxieties that we might be feeling, Lord. We pray that we would have the persistence to just push those aside and be here fully present with your people in the midst of your spirit, guided and gathered around your word. And God, we pray that uh, you would take this time to work in and through us, sharpen our, our hearts and our minds to see you more clearly and understand your wisdom for us. Lord, take this time and use it for your purposes and for the work of your kingdom in us, so that as we go forward, we will be the ambassadors of your kingdom in this world. And we pray all these things in the powerful and mighty name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. For it's in his name that we are gathered here this morning. It's in his name that we come, spirits full, ready to worship. And it's in his name that we now come together and in one voice lift up the prayer he taught his followers to pray as we say together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, welcome to worship. Sim. 
seek you in the morning, and I will learn to walk in your ways, and step by step you'll lead me, and I will follow you all of my days, and step by step you'll lead me, and I will follow you. You know, I'm becoming increasingly convicted or convinced of the detail of God's providential care and interaction and God's, well, I would say really rich and dynamic sense of humor. I began uh, thinking out this morning's message and a new teaching series that we're going to start today. It was several weeks ago. Um, it's based on a passage of scripture that's been very significant in my life over the last couple of years as we as a congregation are stepping out in faith through the Joshua Initiative and as we're going through the, the storm of a global pandemic and, you know, not the most ideal economic season for a capital campaign. But anyway, I've been thinking about this story of Jesus walking on the water through the storm and I've I've just gone back to this many times over the last uh, year or so and, and been inspired by it and been reminded by it. I, I know I've referenced it many times. I don't want to be, you know, Johnny OneNote here talking on the same text all the time, but it, it's been so important uh, in my life over the last uh, uh, year or so, and, and I was really drawn towards this story and thinking about the storm and how we walk through it. And, of course, we have looked previously at the parallel between the the Israelites in Egypt, not the best place for them to be, but where they were and where they were comfortable. We remember that when they went through the wilderness, they even said, why don't we just go back to Egypt where we, where we, were, we had food? And even though we were enslaved there, and we've, we've looked at this parallel of the Israelites in Egypt and then the, the wilderness wandering, this difficult journey they had to make to get to the promised land and the, the promised land ultimately being where God desired them. And and the story of Jesus walking on the water is about Peter and the disciples being in the boat, you know, not necessarily the best place for them, but the place they were. And then this difficult journey that Peter has to make, walking on the water in the storm to get to where God desired for him to be, ultimately in the arms of Christ. And so we've seen the parallel. And so weeks ago, I started thinking about this series, Finding Your Place in the Storm. 
And at no point in time did I have any idea that on the day that we launched this series, we would be gathering indoors for the first time in the remnant of tropical or Hurricane Delta. You know, by the way, as I think I said, the, the 10th named storm to make landfall, setting another record in 2020, the 10th named storm to make landfall in the continental United States. But uh, here we are in the midst of this storm talking about a series calling, that I'm calling Finding Your Place in the Storm. And when I look at this story in Matthew chapter 14, story of the storm, Jesus on the water, the disciples in the boat, Peter walking, I see four distinct positions or places where we can choose to land in that storm, where we can decide to reside. And so what I want to do over the next couple of weeks is analyze each one of these places. Why do we choose those locations? Of course, we'll look at the historical story, but we're also thinking metaphorically about the, the places we land in life, the places where we exist, where we spend our time and get comfortable. And we'll look at the places in the storm where we could be and analyze, is this where Christ wants us? What's, what's the benefit of this place and what's the, the entrapment of this place? And the first place that uh, we, we see in this story comes from Matthew chapter 14. So let me uh, read through this story, starting in verse 23. It says, Jesus went up on a mountainside. This is after they had fed the crowd, after they uh, dispersed a large group of people. Jesus goes up on the mountainside to pray by himself. Later that night, he was there alone, and the boat, the disciples are already in the boat, getting ready to cross the Sea of Galilee. The boat was already a considerable distance from the land, buffeted by the waves because the wind was against it. So the the storm is brewing, and the winds are pushing the boat offshore. Shortly before dawn, Jesus went out to them, to the disciples, walking on the lake. When the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified. It's a ghost, they said, and they cried out in fear. But Jesus immediately said to them, Take courage, it is I, do not be afraid. Lord, if it's you, Peter said, tell me to come to you on the water. Come, Jesus said. Then Peter got down out of the boat, walked on the water, and came toward Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid, and he began to sink, and he cried out, Lord, save me. Immediately, Jesus reached out his hand hand and caught him. You of little faith, he said, why did you doubt? And when they climbed in the boat, the wind died down. Then those who were on the boat worshipped Jesus, saying, truly, you are the Son of God. So over the next couple of weeks, I want to talk about four distinct locations, four places in this storm. And the first one I want us to analyze and think about this morning is the boat itself. Now, we don't have a direct account in this story about Peter being in the boat, but it's certainly inferred all the disciples are in the boat. And then it says Peter got down out of the boat. So we can draw a realistic conclusion that if Peter got out of the boat, at some point he was in the boat. So let's talk about what it means to be in the boats of life. Because in this moment in the world, we know that there are 12 individuals who have committed their lives to being followers of Christ. 12 people who, when Christ came to them and said, come, follow me, I'll make you fishers of men, they they left their nets or they left their their tax collector booth or they left their carpentry shop, and they committed, say, I want to be a follower of Jesus. Theoretically, they were saying to themselves, what would Jesus do and how do I do that with my life? I know they didn't have the little rubber bracelets way back then with the WWJD, but, but they're, they're submitting or surrendering to this concept. Who is Jesus? How do I follow him? How do I honor Christ with my life and with my decisions? What would Jesus do? How does Jesus want me to live? Where does Jesus want me to be? And in this moment, these 12 guys are in this boat. And Jesus has clearly said, come here out of the boat, and only one of the 12 gets down out of the boat. 92% of the Christ followers at that time have decided, you know what, I know where I am, 
and I know where Jesus wants me to be. Clearly, he said, come. But I'm going to choose where I am over where Christ wants me to be. 92% of the Christ followers in the world at this time clearly have an understanding of the conviction of the Holy Spirit, of, of Jesus calling them somewhere else. And they decide, you know what? Instead of that place where Christ is calling me, I'm going to stay where I am. 92% choose the boat. And I wonder how much the numbers have changed over the last 2,000 years. If they've changed. Why do so many of us choose the boats and choose to stay in the boat? And I know somebody probably wants to raise their hand right now and say, hey, uh, Pastor, I don't own a boat. It's not a problem for me. Can I go home now? And we're talking about our metaphorical boats, right? Those places that feel comfortable and normal, our, our patterns and routines. These are individuals who have spent a bulk of their life on the water. They're, they're comfortable. The boat is the place they know. Even those who weren't commercial fishermen to make their living grew up around the Sea of Galilee, a major food, food source for the region. So they're comfortable in the boat. So this is what feels normal, traditional, the way they've always done things, nostalgic, comfortable for them. And so when Christ calls them out of it, what is it that keeps us in the boat? What kept them in the boat? What keeps us in our boats? In our same routines and habits, even when we feel called to something else. You know, after I wrote the manuscript for this morning's message, and even after I recorded the digital service yesterday morning that was emailed out today, I, I, I got a great illustration of this yesterday afternoon. Sarah and I have heard about this documentary on Netflix called The Social Dilemma. Maybe you've heard of it. Maybe you've seen it. It talks about the impact of social media on our brains and on our habits and, and how there's algorithms and there's a strategy in place to monetize our time and attention and the, the mental, spiritual, emotional impact that it can have. And if you haven't seen it, I'm strongly endorsing it and encourage you, if you use social media, if you use technology, uh, we at least need to be aware of the things that are happening. And so we watched this documentary yesterday afternoon, and then after it was over, we gathered the family around, and we said, wow, what do you think? And we all felt the conviction, said, well, we've got to change some things. We've got to be very mindful of this and how much time we're using on technology. And in that moment, you know, uh, we all felt that conviction. About three hours later, I walked into the living room, and I was on my phone, and I looked around to five other people on their devices. Even though three hours earlier we'd had this strong conviction that we can't, we can't do this. We've got to be mindful of this. We've got to get out of this boat, this routine, these habits. You see, ultimately we realize this is comfortable. It's what we're accustomed to. It's how we do, especially on a Rainy Saturday afternoon, we had some plans outside, those, those got canceled, so what are we going to do? For parents, we know that sometimes technology feels like the path of least resistance, right? We get a little quiet time, the kids are engaged and entertained. So what is it that keeps us in those boats when we, when we feel the conviction, even when we feel communal conviction as a whole and we have accountability partners and we're going we're gonna to work together, we're going to get out of this boat, we're going to choose life more abundant. We're going to choose a deeper and richer relationship with Christ when we feel that conviction. What is it that keeps us in those boats? As I think about it, I think the first thing is fear. Right? Look at what it says. When the disciples saw Jesus walking on the water, they were terrified. What, what is this new thing? It's fear. How does this work? What? You know, what if, uh, what if we step out of the boat? What if we follow this conviction? What if we go into this new thing and, it, and, and we're ill-prepared? Or we're not ready or we're, we, we don't have the, the qualifications? What if the, the Lord is calling you to a new volunteer role in his kingdom or a new ministry or a new occupation or, or new spiritual disciplines or new habits in your eating or your health or, or whatever you feel that conviction that the Lord is calling you to something life more abundant and, and the first question is, what if this doesn't work out? What if it fails? What if I step out of the boat and go right to the bottom of the lake? Fall on my face. 
But if I'm uh, not educated enough or not talented enough or not prepared enough or not equipped enough or not able, step out, out of the boat. What if it fails? So fear, fear keeps us in the boat. And it's often a fear that's rooted in uncertainty. Think about it, the disciples are uncertain. The, the source of their fear, they've been on boats before. They've been in storms on boats before. <clears throat> what they haven't done before is seen somebody walking on the water in the middle of that storm. It causes uncertainty, which leads to fear. You see, they don't understand. What's the science of what we're seeing? What's the, 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 the physics of what we're seeing? The stats don't add up. The numbers don't come together. We can't rationalize it. We can't make a good, solid uh, argument based on facts and statistics of why this is working. So it's that uncertainty that leads to fear. When the disciples saw him walking on the water, they were terrified. Uncertainty and fear. <clears throat> final thing that I think often leads us into the boats is comfort, right? It's what's comfortable. It's what we've always done. It's what's nostalgic. It's what's traditional. Last night when I walked into the room with my phone, like I said, it was comfortable. It's a relaxing, mind-numbing, easy way to spend an evening. It's comfortable. And so comfort keeps us in the boat. Look, there's a level of fear and uncertainty in every aspect of our life. Right? We, you are gathered here in a public place in the middle of a global pandemic. Right? We've, <clears throat> we've put in protocols in place to kind of mitigate the risk, but you're taking a risk. You took a risk to get in your car and get out in the roads in the middle of a remnant of a hurricane to, to come. Every time you get in your... There, there, look, there's a... There's a level of fear and risk and uncertainty in every aspect of our life. None of us are omnipotent and omniscient. We can't control our life, but, but we can mitigate the risk. We can, we can take it to a place where we're comfortable with the risks that we are taking. Then when God calls us to something new, something we can't mitigate, something we can't wrap our minds around, something we can't fully comprehend, there's that comfort that calls us back to what is common. What is our typical approach and discipline? So what keeps us in the boat? Well, fear. Fear often rooted in, rooted in uncertainty. How, how will it look and how will it work if I get out of the boat? And comfort. You know, the boats are kind of comfortable. We become accustomed to them and life in the boat. So the next question after we answer what keeps us in the boat is to ask the question, what's wrong with the boat? What's, I mean, come on, Pastor, what's so bad about being in the boat? Think about it. You could make a very rational argument, and it would be hard to argue that it's wrong, that the boat is the best place to be. I don't know about you, but I've been in boats before in major storms. <clears throat> and there's a little bit of fear in that, and there's a little bit of uncertainty, but based on the options, I'd rather be in the boat than out of the boat. So what's so bad about life in the boat? These guys are experienced fishermen, most of them. They've looked at the, uh, the situation they're in. They've, they've weighed their options, and they have all decided, 92% of them decided, you know, the better choice is to be in the boat. And every statistical measure we could apply, every uh, aspect of reason and rationale, every ounce of common sense would say, they're right. What's so wrong with being in the boat? Well, in this instance, there's only one thing wrong with being in the boat. And the single thing that's wrong with being in the boat is that Jesus has called them elsewhere. That's the only thing wrong with being in the boat. I mean, I'm not here to demonize boat dwelling. I know we all have routines and disciplines that we get into. The only thing that's wrong with those routines and disciplines is when Christ is clearly calling us out of them. And yet the fear and uncertainty and comfort of our our day-to-day -day life and our, our routines and patterns keeps us in the boats. But the boats inherently are not evil. In fact, look at what happens later on. Verse 32. And then Peter and Jesus climbed into the boat. The wind died down and they worshipped him. 
So at the end of this story, just a few minutes later, Jesus is in the boat and everybody's worshiping him. So guess what? At the end of the story, you know where the place to be is? In the boat with Jesus worshiping. And I know somebody wants to nudge. Probably Larry's nudging Bill back there. Dan's been in quarantine too long. He's losing it. In the boat, out of the boat. What, is, what, is, what are we supposed to do? What, what is he talking about? Get out of the boat. No, wait, Jesus is back in the boat. Get in the boat. That, yes, that's what I'm talking about. Where is Jesus? Say, this morning, I'm not, I'm not calling us to wild living. Right, let's just go out there, go crazy, whatever, illogical, irrational, nonsensical, wildest idea. Go out there and do it in the name of Jesus. Be the evil Knievels of Christianity. Just go out there and, and do any crazy thing and say, I'm getting out of the boat just like Pastor Dan told me to. That's not what I'm saying. In fact, there's a, a mantra that's kind of growing and, and going around night, right now, and <clears throat> maybe you've heard it, that it's called faith over fear, and, and people are, are using this. Frankly, they're misusing it, in my opinion, in my observation, in many instances. You know, they're looking at the, the fear-inducing things around us, and they're saying, faith over fear. You know, God will protect us. And, and some of them are using it to excuse making wise choices and taking wise precautions in this time. And just saying, you know what, if, if God wants to protect us, God will protect us. Well, you know what, the only problem with that is when, when Satan tempts Jesus to jump off the top of the temple and says, if God loves you, God will protect you, Jesus kind of says, well, that's not how it works. Satan's basically saying, faith, faith over fear, just, just jump. If God wants to protect you, he'll protect you. Jesus says, that's not how it works. God calls us to make wise choices. He says, don't put the Lord, your God, to the test. So I'm not calling us to go out and just wild and crazy, you know, whatever wild hair comes to your mind, and, and let's just, you know, faith over fear, just go out there. We want to be the evil Knievels of Christianity, whatever wild idea comes to your mind. Hey, let's get out of the boat. Let's try it. Let's do it. That's not what I'm calling. I'm not calling us to wildness. The whole point of this is discernment. There's a time when Jesus is out of the boat, and he's calling his disciples to be there where he is. And there's a time where Jesus is in the boat, and they are worshiping and saying, truly, you are the Son of God. So this message is not really about, hey, let's just jump out of the boats and, and live life with a full abandon, just, just go crazy. This message is about discernment. How much time are we spending reflecting on our lives, on our patterns, on our habits, on our spiritual disciplines, on the, the, the comfort that we have, the way we do things, how we do them, when we do them, and how much time are we spending saying, is this what Jesus wants for me? And when we get that conviction about how we should use social media or technology or how we should eat or exercise disciplines or, or spiritual practices or, or a, a new thing, you know, sometimes God will call us big new things, get out of the boat new career or a new ministry or a new position or volunteerism or, or whatever it is, when we feel that conviction, are we willing to get out of the boat, out of our patterns, out of our routines, out of what is comfortable, and step out in faith and try? And the important thing for us to remember in this is that Christ has called us to life more abundant to rich relationship with him and a peace that surpasses all understanding. And I would say that in this moment, for a little while, while Peter is walking on the water, he is the closest to life more abundant than anybody that's in that boat. And so the point for us to understand is, if we seek that life more abundant, that peace that surpasses all understanding, that, that rich relationship with Christ, if we are not where Christ has called us to be, it doesn't matter how safe, secure, or comfortable our boat is, we will not experience the true depth of that life more abundant, the true peace that surpasses all understanding, the true depth of rich relationship with Christ. And on the flip side, the inverse is true. If we are, if we are where Jesus is calling us to be, if we're applying the disciplines and the habits and the, the conviction that he's, he's putting into our lives, if we're applying, then it doesn't matter 
how the wind and the waves and the storms around us are swirling, we will experience a peace that surpasses all understanding, life more abundant, deep and rich connection with Christ. So this morning's message is really not about wild and crazy, jump out of your boats, risk it all, do whatever crazy idea comes to mind. This morning's message is really about discernment. Are we where Christ is calling us to be? And if we're not, how do we get out of our boats? How do we put aside fear and uncertainty and comfort and nostalgia and tradition and the way we've always done this, that, or the other? Our old habits, our bad habits, how do we put all that aside? Take those steps of faith and obedience that lead us closer to Christ. Amen. Water you turn into church as it is pastor appreciation day so i just want to take a moment and just acknowledge dan dan if you'll come up here with me especially in this crazy 2020 season that we've had dan has really um stepped up he has you know he has communicated greater than ever he has gone just above and beyond getting us to stay engaged, to be involved through Bible study, through online, you name it, we've done it, and we'll continue to do that. So I just want to say to you, Dan, by working as a pastor, you work on behalf of God. In your spiritual duties, you not only serve in the role of pastor, but also as advisor, advocate, teacher, and friend. As you preach the word of the Lord, you allow our body to experience the joy of God's presence. Thank you for working 
a mission that is greater than yourself, and for bringing the gift of faith into the hearts of everyone in this congregation. May God be with you and never let you go as you serve him in this church. And I'd like to read Hebrews 13, 17. Have confidence in your leaders and submit to their authority because they keep watch over you as those who must give an account. Do this so that their work will be a joy, not a burden, for that would be of no benefit to you. This verse reminds us of why we need to appreciate our pastor. And lastly, I have a little desk reminder, and it says, thank you, pastor. And there's a quote from John C. Maxwell, and it says, a leader is one who knows the way, goes the way, and shows the way. Thank you, Dan. Well, thank you all very much. Uh, I, I really, really appreciate that. You know, this is... Uh, <laughs> uh, having the opportunity to have conversations with many colleagues in this unique season in the life of Christianity and in the church, uh, I appreciate your appreciation for me, but I want to tell you what an incredible blessing it is to pastor this church um, because of the unique way that this church loves each other, the unique way this church serves. Uh, that Unless you've, I don't know, been in leadership in multiple congregations, you know that there's no other way to say this. And Some churches get it. Some don't. And you don't know how incredible a blessing it is to serve a church that gets it and, and focuses on the bigger idea, the reason we're together, and doesn't get caught in the weeds and the, the mud and, and, and get distracted. And so, uh, like I said yesterday, I sent out a text Anybody help move chairs? We had 20-some people here preparing this. Uh, what a blessing it is to serve a congregation like that. Uh, so thank you. I, and, and again, like I said earlier, you know, Becky, I appreciate you appreciating me. But, man, if there's anybody we have to be thankful for right now, it is Becky. <laughs> because I could not pastor. The blessing you've been to our staff and to me and to our congregation is just uh, phenomenal. So thank you for all that you do. And thank you all for being that church that, that gets it and, and focuses on loving each other well and doesn't get caught up in the weeds and, and nonsense and just says, how can we continue to be the hands and feet of Christ? And so as we go forward, let's, let's do that. Let's be mindful of our, our boats and, you know, let's be people who are self-aware and who examine our lives and how we're living and think, you know, you know this is a boat I've been in for a while, and, and, and what is, is Christ calling me out? Is Christ calling me to a new thing? And if we, if we hear that calling, if we feel that conviction, let's be sure that it's not fear or uncertainty or comfort that keeps us in the boat, that we are people that follow Christ wherever he goes. And as we go, following him, May the grace, mercy, and peace which comes from God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit be upon each and every one of you this day and every day forevermore. Amen.